you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me
serve a great God and I think we can really do a little bit more and put a, a little bit more of ourselves into acknowledging Him this morning. Can we lift up our hands today and truly, truly acknowledge the greatness of God? We don't really have to remind God how great He is. God is great. But sometimes we have to remind ourselves, family, that we serve a great God and that no lie of the devil, no limitation imposed upon us, nothing, nothing can hinder us and stop us from experiencing this great God in a personal and in an intimate way. Can we make that our prayer this morning before we do anything else, before we get onto our program for the day because we don't like to be programmed. Today it's not about a, a church program but it's always about the gathering of the family. We coming together before our Father God and He is just looking at us for who we are today, not the way we are dressed. Nothing else, no pretenses. Father, we come before you today truly as our Heavenly Father and we as your children, Lord. And we want to acknowledge your greatness in our lives. And Lord, by acknowledging that, we want to rise up above all of our circumstances, Lord. Every limitation, every prohibition that, that we've imposed upon ourselves, but is not from the heavens. And we come before you today knowing that we are gathered as a family, that we are in the right place, that our hearts are going to be just laid bare before you so that you can do whatever it is that you want to do through the worship that we will offer to you today, through the word that will come to us today, through the presentation of our lives and our offerings before you today, through the way we greet one another today, as, as, as it was in the early church where the excitement was such that, that they greeted one another even with a holy kiss. But Lord, we pray that as we embrace one another, as we embrace the spirit of family today, Lord, that miracles can take place in this environment, Father. Healings and, and deliverances can take place here in this environment. Because now that we have gathered as family, that we have gathered in your name, then this is holy ground. This is a place where great things can take place. So we give ourselves to you. We give the furtherance of this meeting over to you, Lord. And we just want to declare our undying love for you. Lord, when, when we just lay aside all of the noise of this world, all of the things that go in and out of our mind, it simply comes down to this, that we want to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our minds, Lord. And we want to love one another in the same way. Bless our gathering today. Amen, amen, amen. Can we praise in, in our claps? And as I said, there must be such an excitement about seeing one another. So please do that. Greet one another today. And... Um, and make it a genuine greeting today. You may be seated once you've, you've done that. Well, good morning. A very, very warm and a special welcome to each and every one of you. Uh, it's so good to see the place starting to, to fill up on Sunday mornings now. And um, thank you for that. Thank you for making the, the return. And I know that this is going to be a fantastic year after the week that we've, we've, especially after the week that we've just had. So welcome to all of our GMS family. Welcome to the many visitors that are here. Uh, if you are visiting with us today for the first time, can we, can we maybe just see your hand? Ah, we have a family there. Thank you. Visitors, great. Welcome, everybody. And also, um, and if you are visiting, even for a few weeks, uh, but you haven't met any one of us, or we don't have 
any details, please come and see the elders here at the front after the service. We'd really love to get to know you uh, much better. And of course, we want to welcome our online audience as well that's always with us from all parts of uh, the world, in fact. Well, we've had a wonderful week of fasting and prayer. Um, did you fast? Yes. <laughs> Um, but the turnout that we had on the Friday night pr prayer meeting, which was also a, a wonderful gathering of prayer, we know that, that this has been a good week. Uh, generally, from what we are hearing from some of the reports, is uh, the general feeling is that there was such a sense of calm. There was a peace that people experienced that they've never experienced before. God spoke to us this week in a very gentle way. And let's not forget that. Sometimes we only want to hear God in the loud thunderous voice, in the thunder and in the lightning. But God also chooses to speak to us in a very small and gentle voice. And, and we feel this week that that is how God has spoken to many of us. Uh, hang on to that. Um, you know, every Wednesday at GMS is a fasting day. We set Wednesdays as a day of fasting for the family. So please continue with that. I think also this fast has taught us or taken us a step forward closer to what it means to live a fasted life. Uh, so let's keep that momentum going, okay? Let's keep it going. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful week where we think that the pillar of prayer was really lifted up. And we must keep that going in, in the house churches. Um, well, I want you to, to stand with me as I read this, the scriptures this morning. I want to read from the book of Ezra, uh, chapter 8, and from 21. And I'm not going to stop and explain anything throughout the verses as I read. Just allow the Holy Spirit to do that for you. But the backdrop to this is that Ezra is leading a group of people. They're returning from exile back to Jerusalem. And we must think of this in the context of us being a Reformation people. All right? And the journey from exile back to their homeland was not a romantic journey. We're going back home. They would face many perils along the way. Uh, there, would be armed, there would be bandits that would be waiting to rob them. And uh, so it was a treacherous journey. In fact, it was so treacherous that some actually chose not to go back. Uh, they would stay in their safety uh, zones. But Ezra led one of these uh, cohorts. There were three returns from, from exile. Uh, Zerubbabel led one. Ezra led one of those uh, returns. And Nehemiah led another one. But we want to focus here on Ezra chapter 8. So they were now ready to leave. And verse 21 says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from Him a safe journey for us, our little ones, and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request from the king troops and horsemen to protect us from the enemy on the way, because we had said to the king, the hand of our God is favorably disposed to all those who seek him, but his power and his anger are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and sought our God concerning this matter, and he listened to our entreaty. Then I set apart twelve of the leading priests, Sheribiah, Hashabiah, and with them ten of their brothers. And I weighed out to them the silver, the gold, and the utensils, the offering for the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his princes and all Israel present there had offered. Thus I weighed into their hands 650 talents of silver and silver utensils worth 100 talents and 100 gold talents and 20 gold bowls worth 1,000 derricks and two utensils of fine shiny bronze, precious as gold. Then I said to them, you are holy to the Lord. Say, I am holy to the Lord. 
and the utensils are holy and the silver and the gold are a free will offering to the Lord God of our fathers. Watch and keep them until you weigh them before the leading priests, the Levites and the heads of the fathers, households of Israel at Jerusalem in the chambers of the Lord. So the priests and the Levites accepted the weighed out silver and gold and the utensils to bring them to Jerusalem to the house of our God. Then we journeyed from the river Ahava on the 12th of the first month to go to Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was over us and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and the ambushes by the way. Thus we came to Jerusalem and remained there three days. The power of fasting, the power of, of setting ourselves before God like flint. Amen. So even they were not ambushed, the enemies were kept away from them because they declared a fast. Shall we just lift our hands today? We are no more going to be ambushed. Yes, we, we have enemies all along the way but he is a defeated enemy we have to walk in the divine protection of our lord but there's also something that god requires of us our holiness our holiness and our obedience absolute simple obedience father our hearts are so thankful today as again we we just want to present ourselves before you lord we know in this week many good things have happened you have communicated with so many. We thank you that this, in this week we heard of how children fasted, Lord, and kept the fast with diligence before you. I thank you that we are seeing a generation arising, Lord, that is going to take the principles of your word and they're going to grab your heart and they're going to run and they'll even run further than we have run, Father. And we encourage that. We thank you for that, Lord. And we know that, that we serve this living God, this great God. I thank you that, that if nothing else happened this week, if, if it's just that you became a greater reality in our lives, then we've accomplished so much. But we know that you are a reality in our lives and you come to us also with gifts. And today we can testify that many have received those gifts in this week, Lord. And we do not want the material things of this world that is secondary, that comes to us as a fringe benefit from you. But first we want you. First we want you, Lord. And everything else then will be added unto us. So thank you. Bless our gathering today, Lord. Inhabit the praises of your people. Let these songs, Lord, carry with it an incense unto you today, Lord. And we know that you will respond to that in our lives. So we bless you. We honor you. We dedicate our lives and we dedicate this meeting to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, let's give the Lord a hand again. And we're going to hand over to, to Bradley and the team and they're going to lead us. Remember, uh, teas, coffee is available after service. If you're breaking fast with us today, then please do that and partake with us. God bless you. Can we give the Lord a shout of praise for He's worthy? That, that was for yourself. Now let's just give the King of Kings, the Most High God, a shout of praise. Let's halal Him. He's worthy to be praised. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, we are not just the body of Christ, but we are God's habitation. That means we are God's dwelling place. Bible tells us that we are, we are not strangers, we are not foreigners, but when we enter into the new covenant of God, we become uh, fellow citizens in Ephesians 2.19. The reference is fellow citizens and saints, which means we are firstborn sons, but we are, we, are, we are built upon the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. The reference here is is that when you build, you build only on Christ alone. Amen? So I want you to look at your neighbor and just say, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being built on the rock. Amen, amen. The Lamb of God. Acquainted with 
without the music and our hands lifted up. And our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God Father, we are such a privileged people to praise you, to lift up your name, to exalt you from the depths of our hearts, to acknowledge you as the sovereign, the only one, the only God. And today, what a privilege it is to sing these songs because we know you through Jesus Christ our Lord and we know you and your power because of what you have done for us and today Lord we worship you we praise you you are indeed a mighty God all powerful all empowering you are the only God that we know that we can worship in spirit and in truth. We bless your name today. We bless your name. We bless your name, O oh God. And we thank you. We thank you for yokes of bondage that are being broken, for chains that, are, that, that have shackled us, that are being unshackled. We thank you for breakthroughs and deliverances. We thank you for the spirit of heaviness that is being removed. We thank you for your spirit that is being placed in each one of our lives. And we know, Lord, that the miracles that you have promised in these end times will become a reality. For you are the God of miracles. And I thank you that many, many miracles have taken place in this week. Many souls have been touched. Many spirits have been refreshed. And many bodies have experienced the reviving presence that comes from you. We give you glory today, Father. We give you honor. We bless your name. Yours is the glory, yours is the power, yours is the dominion. Blessed be your holy name. Blessed be your holy name. Blessed be your name. Amen. Amen. Wow, just greet somebody next to you. Such a wonderful spirit in this place. Such a beautiful spirit of praise and worship. Thank you, guys. We can release our children to the children's ministry. Good morning. I can see some, most of you are still on the fast. Good morning, everybody. Are you blessed? Have you enjoyed the week? How many of you had to suffer through it? <laughs> but what a joy it is to not think about separating ourselves from food, but the joy of separating ourselves unto the Lord. Very big difference. I sometimes wonder whether Moses really fasted because he was caught up in the presence of the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. And it's easy not to drink water or eat food if you're in his immediate presence, his unveiled presence. But Jesus did fast because he was taken to be tested in the wilderness and he engaged a supernatural fast where he did not only not eat food, but he also 
from a human point of view, did the impossible. He did not drink water for 40 days. And obviously, at the end of that, he was at the point of death when angels had to come and minister to him. Amazing, isn't it? And while we've not been called to fast like that, we've been encouraged in the new covenant to inculcate the disciplines of fasting. And the, the, the New Testament, new covenant fast, is a, is a fast where we abstain from food and we devote ourselves to the Lord so that our spirits are so sharp that when we do speak, demons cannot stand the piercing words that come out of our mouth. Even Jesus said that this kind, certain demons, can only come out when you inculcate the discipline of fasting and prayer. And as Pastor Cruz said, it is a lifestyle. And we have to learn how in a world of many offerings, many temptations, uh, we have to learn how to live a fasted life unto the Lord. A fasted life is a life of total dedication and devotion to Him, where we learn how to be, in a spiritual sense, celibates unto the Lord. And we choose to devote our lives completely to Him, that we are servants, bond slaves. We are married to the Lord, and we choose to keep the chaste position of dedication, devotion, and the whole spirit of acquiescence unto the Lord, where we are totally surrendered, despite our clever reasoning and our rationalizing of things and our opinions and our views of life, we choose to submit and surrender to His will. And that's, that's ultimately, fasting must bring you to a place of total subservience. Total subservience. Where you do not anymore live for yourself, but you live totally unto Him. You think we can get there? It's not easy. I promise you because this flesh resurrects every day. And Paul teaches us that this flesh must be crucified every day. And every day we have to die to self so that we do not live for tomorrow, but we live each day for the Lord. And when tomorrow comes, crucify, die to self, and devote our lives completely to Him. And that's the way God chose us to live. In this message, which is session number five, on the Amorite spirit is a message that is filled with wisdom, counsel, and strategy. This is a message that's got to do with the eschatological period that we are living in, a prophetic moment, a poignant moment, and a moment where our steps have to be directed by the Lord. God's word is our lamp, our light, our map, God's word gives us all the necessary strategies we need to live effectively in this world. The church is now coming to a stage, the true church is now coming to a stage where some very powerful things will happen in the earth. When I say the true church, there are two churches in the earth, the true church and the false church. Uh, there are many imageries for that. One is the goat church and the sheep church. Uh, one is uh, the sons of God, and the other is the sons of the evil one. And while I'm not here to judge who is the true church and who is the false church, I'm here to present to you what God wants the true church to hear. And there is, you know, wherever there's the genuine, there'll always be the spurious. But there's a church emerging in the earth. And that church is emerging from the ashes of desolation. And that church is going to be a glorious, triumphant church with, with dominion entrusted to it for the time that we're living in. And it will be a church that will steward the purposes of God. 
So when I talk about the Amorite spirit, I am trying to find patterns in the old covenant or in the new covenant genre of scripture and uh, extract from it fundamental principles that can be applied to this present context. Well, God has not promised us land like he promised to the sons of Abraham, the natural sons of Abraham, when he gave them a piece of land in the Middle East, today called Israel. God has promised the new Israel, the new covenant people, dominion over the whole of creation. Uh, that's what we are given. Uh, we are uh, exalted to the right hand of God, which means given executive privileges, jurisdictional rights, and tremendous power and authority to rule over every space, every domain, every field of expertise in the earth. That's our responsibility. And the church is to fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of God. And we are moving at a rapid uh, speed now to a place where that, th those promises have to become a reality. So we are living in the, in the reality of the fulfillment of the promises of God for each one of us. The church is called to live in a place of fulfillment. So when I draw comparatives, uh, like the spirit of the Amorite, uh, that co the comparative would be that if that was the dominant spirit in the time where Moses was preparing the people to transition across the Jordan into the promised land, and he was preparing them, then that comparative has to have relevancy to us today. There has to be some kind of application for the present church because nothing God has given us in the old was just to fill us with historical narratives, but it was to teach us, edify us, educate us, instruct us, inform us, so that we will be well equipped to fulfill our end time mandate. Do you get that? This is critical. So when I read the Bible, I'm not reading it just to get the, uh, the uh, just to accumulate information and knowledge. I'm reading it so that I could translate the information and the knowledge into counsel, into wisdom, and ultimately into understanding. Uh, and un understanding is the implementation of all of the things that God has taught us. And that's how we become a people endowed with the grace of the ancient of days. The wisdom of God then becomes a reality in each one of our lives. And the Amorite spirit can be compared to the world that we live in today. And this spirit occupies, as I told you, that piece of land before the nation of Israel will cross the Jordan into the promised land. And, and this was a very luscious, very fertile, productive space um, on the wilderness side of the Jordan before the nation of Israel will cross it. And the nation of Israel, the requisite was that you, if you want to establish domain across the Jordan, you have to know how to take the Amorite spirit that, that lives on the wilderness side of the Jordan. And that spirit, uh, by overcoming it, you are being prepared to exercise dominion over all the things that God will give you in the days coming ahead of you. And, and Moses prepares the people to take the, this predominant spirit. And I told you last week that this spirit was known as a mountaineering spirit. In other words, it lived on mountains. Uh, the, the imagery of that, uh, in a metaphoric way, is that this was a dominant spirit. It was an elevated spirit. It was a governmental spirit. It was an authoritative spirit. It was a spirit that knew how to establish dominion over the earth. This spirit was, was prominent in that region a very, very successful region, extremely fertile. 
extremely powerful. And some of the, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss two of the kingdoms that, that came out of the Amorites. And one I'm going to start introducing to us today. But this is a spirit that knew how to establish dominion by controlling mindsets. Uh, it knew how to present a persona, an image, a worldview, uh, paradigms, um, ideologies that, that would become uh, enthroned into, um, in, uh, or enshrined into the minds of people. This was a very, very powerful spirit, like the dominant spirit that we have in the world today, uh, the spirit of, of postmodernism. Uh, which has various, various um, uh, arms to it, ancillary arms to it. This is a very powerful spirit, and, 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 uh, which enshrines individualism, which chooses uh, uh, su survival and, uh, uh, and, and personal gains uh, against learning how to live in community. That's the postmodern spirit. And the Amorite had to be conquered. And I gave you all the meanings of, uh, of, of the Amorite. It was a dominant people in the jo jo uh, Jordanian region, a kingdom people. Uh, they represented a human-centric principle of self-existence. Um, they governed by c controlling opinion, uh, worldview. And, um, and they used words. They were very good with, with verbalizing. They were sayers. That's, that's the literal meaning of the name Amorite. Um, they, they used polished speech. They were eloquent, articulate. Um, they were publicist and dramatist. They knew how to create a pretentious outward appearance very much like the world, the Western world that we live in. In fact, the Amorite was called in those days the Westerners. Um, so they were a, a, an ideological giant. Um, and, uh, and they used the power of imaginative thinking. Uh, so existence was based on how you control thoughts. Uh, and, uh, and through the controlling of thoughts, the intelligence of man was highlighted. Uh, and you can draw the parallels today with the world that we are living in. Um, and, and this world is, is uh, you know, intelligence is proliferating at an alarming rate. Uh, artificial intelligence in its, uh, in its various expressions uh, uh, is producing knowledge uh, independent of God independent of that which comes from God, at a level that is frightening uh, today in the world. And, um, and we, the Church of Jesus Christ, is called to overcome the Spirit. And how do you overcome the Spirit? Now, we are living in a world where we're being bombarded with information all the time. We are being castigated. We are you know, this world system is making us eunuchs. It's taking away our power to procreate. Uh, we, can, uh, we can recreate, um, but we're always operating on the wisdom of man, on the intelligence of man. And God is now calling the church to arise and be separate from this world. I told you that the journey of the nation of Israel for 38 years was a journey from a, from a mountain called Oreb to a place called Kadesh Barnea. Uh, I mentioned this last week, and Horeb is a place that produces illumination, uh, enlightenment, and if for want of a better word, revelation. Uh, Oreb is the place where you gather information from an eternal position, uh, where the wisdom of God is, is disclosed. Uh, in a very powerful way. But Kadesh Banya was the place where you had, to, you had to learn how to take the raw materials of revelation and wisdom and counsel and then translate it into systems, into structures, into, into an organizational way of functioning, into culture, 
into conduct, into mannerisms. Uh, it, it's, it's the principle of taking revelation and incarnating it so it becomes a manifest position. That's what Kadesh Banya means. Kadesh Banya also means that you have to learn how now to become a people distinct from the world order, very distinct from Babylonian thinking, from Egyptian thinking, from Assyrian thinking. And you do know that the nation of Israel struggled with freeing themselves from the bondages and the habits they developed in Egypt. And, and we've had a very common saying in this church and in many church circles where we tell people that it's very easy to be led out of Egypt. But to get Egypt out of us can take a lifetime. In the, in the, in the culture or in the experience of the nation of Israel, at least 38 years before every person who had the mentality of Egypt died. Every person who voted against the plans of God died. And, and believe me when I tell you, most of us have been brainwashed. We've been subtly influenced by the world order that we live in. Um, the enemy knows how to wrap his mind or his, himself around our minds. He knows how to pollute our minds. Uh, later on, I will show you that we have to choose from which tree we would eat. And there is a tree that the enemy has wrapped himself, coiled himself around. And Eve was, was, was kind of entrapped by the offerings that came from that tree. And uh, there is another tree called the tree of righteousness that we need to eat from. And so when we talk about our minds, it's the biggest enemy we have today. The biggest enemy. You know, the, the, the first apostles uh, in an age of many ideologies like Gnosticism and, and various other mythologies and ideologies of the time in which they lived, realized that what Jesus did on the cross was a finished work. It was completed. When he said it is finished, the enemy was completely disarmed. Satan had no power even though he was not yet judged. God had, in the new covenant, shifted us, elevated us to a position of such governance, such authority, that even demons feared us. But the biggest enemy that the apostles found was an enemy that exalted itself against the knowledge of God in the patterns of thinking. And this is a very complicated system where minds of people have been held captive while the enemy freed them or allowed them to be freed. Or they were freed supernaturally by Christ, yet their minds were still held in captivity and in darkness. And so many of us, so many of us have been held captive. You know, I love the imagery, and I've shared it on Easter, in Easter gatherings with us, that God in his wisdom used strategic positions to highlight prophetic insights. For example, Jesus hung on a tree on a pole in a place called Golgotha. Golgotha means a place of the skull. And the skull contains our brain. And there, in the place of the skull, the wisdom of God hung on a tree so that our minds that were at enmity with God can be reconciled to God at the cross. And he fixed the problem on the tree that was started on another tree in the garden of, of Eden. And let me tell you, you are what you think. As a man thinks, 
As a woman thinks, so is he or she. Say to your neighbor, you are what you think. Your existence cannot take place without your belief system, without your mindset. That's why the greatest war that's taking place today is an ideological war. It's the highest form of warfare. We don't even know anymore what is true and what is false. There are so many theories that are being released through various communicational platforms. And today, if we are not discerning, we will never know light from darkness. In fact, Paul says that false apostles dress themselves in forms of light. Paul says it. They masquerade as angels of light, even though they are wolves in sheep clothing. And so the church has to come to a place of separating. And when we talk about Kadesh Banya, and, uh, and when we talk about the Amorite spirit, it means that we have to come to a place where God's way overrides our way. Where God's thoughts supplants our thoughts. Where the heavenly way becomes our way. Throughout the book of Deuteronomy, and I, I think you should read it over and over and over again, some of the salient points repetitiously brought by Moses to the people of Israel was, you have to carefully observe what I teach you. You have to obey, obey all the stipulations of the word. You must not deviate to the right or to the left. In fact, God even positioned them between two mountains. One was a mountain of blessings, and the other was a mountain of cursings. And, he, and, and there's a causative principle that is established there. If you do this, you will live out of a mountain of blessings. But if you do not do it, you will enjoy or you will suffer the consequences of a curse. I'm beginning to realize it's so simple to live a righteous life. All you have to do is just simply accept what God tells you. Don't add your opinion to it because you may just add curses to whatever God tells you to do. And God sometimes will tell you to do impossible things. I mean, when I think about the first feast in the new covenant, the Jesus, well, the marriage feast that Jesus attended, and his mother said to the disciples when wine ran out, he said to the disciples, whatever he tells you, do it. Whatever he tells you, do it. And certain things sound foolish. Foolish. Like fill the water pots or the purificational pots with water. And dish it out. Serve it. Serve the water. But when the people partake of it, it will become wine. And that's foolishness. It's foolishness to take a boy's lunch and attempt to, to, to feed 5,000 men besides women and children. It's foolish. It's foolish to think that you can cast your line into the waters and you'll catch a fish. But when you open his mouth, you'll have enough money to pay the taxes. It does not make sense. The things that God tells us to sometimes do does not make sense. But who cares whether it makes sense or not? After all, our senses are, 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 are corrupted. Our reasoning is corrupted. Our arguments are flawed. Our worldview is deficient. The only thing that is pure and unadulterated is God's way. And to overcome the Amorite spirit, the church must learn to follow God wholeheartedly. Say to your neighbor, wholeheartedly. And, and later on I will share with you how important it is to listen to the instruction of your fathers. And I would like to rather brazenly say it today. 
that I would consider myself as one of the fathers, sharing the wisdom and counsel of God with you. I'm, I'm not claiming it, but I, I would like to consider myself as one. And if you sit in this house, then you come here to receive wisdom and counsel and teachings. And if you can follow those ways, you're guaranteed success. You want that? You want that? So say to your neighbor, we have to overcome the Amorite spirit. And what do you have to overcome? Human wisdom and power. And we have, I mean, I know the people in this house. Over 80% highly educated, highly influential people sitting in tremendous seats of influence in business sectors, in educational sectors, in medical sectors, in universities. But that wisdom is not going to help you. You may need to go like Daniel, like Moses, and study in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar and Pharaoh. You may need to know the, the, the science of the Chaldeans. And you need to accumulate all of those degrees that you have. But let me tell you, human wisdom and power cannot give you what God wants to give you. There's a better way of doing it. In the new covenant, we have to now learn how to weaponize ourselves so that we can start fighting spiritually. Spiritually. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual, even to the pulling down of every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The war that we are fighting now in the world can only be overcome by the wisdom of God. Because most of the statements we make will be classified hate speech. This is the kind of war we're fighting. It's going to take a higher wisdom, a higher grace to have dominion in the world that we are living in. We are re requested to learn how to become uh, more acquainted with spiritual ways. And we have to learn from the scriptures. And, you know, I, there's a way that a, a bird flies in the sky and the, the way a serpent slithers on a rock. And there's a way of a man or a woman. And, 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 and similarly, we need to know the way of the sons of God with their father. And his way is an amazing way. We, what I'm asking us to do in this time, and I want to rush through this, but unpack it in future, in, in, in the months ahead of us, is to know the spirit of the age that you're living in. You need to know the spirit because he's, he's, he's blinded us. He's put a veil over us. And he's robbing us of engaging the things that God wants. To know the spirit of the age, you have to know the rulers of this age. Uh, uh, and the spirit of this cosmos. And we have to dissect, this is not from God and this is from God. This is, when we do these things, we are going to, we're going to fine tune our spirits so that we'll increase our levels of perception and discernment. Are you hearing me today? Uh, and unfortunately, if you are going to separate yourself unto God in the way I'm asking us to, then you have to have a monotheistic view of God. You can't have a pluralistic view that, oh, God can appear and reveal himself in various ways, in various religions, in various perspectives. There's only one way. That way is called Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what we call the Christocentric, the Christ-centered approach to how we view life. Our spectacles are very simple. We cannot process anything but through Christ. That's our filter. Say to your neighbor, Jesus is the way. And to do that, we need to develop a worldview that, that patterns the way Jesus viewed God and related to him in his humanity. And the church has been called to that. We have to be, if you want to live in this world, you have to become a witness of the one true God. 
and all of us have come to know him and when we came to know him we discovered that he is our father and we don't have many fathers we have one father of the families in heaven and on earth and we have become his children for as many has received him to them gave he the right the privilege to be called the sons of God say to your neighbor God is my father I am his son male and female I am his son we must also become holy we have to develop a standard of distinctiveness we, people must be able to while we are not extremists we are not fanatics we are not pietists we are not self-righteous and we are not putting on some kind of a religious show we must develop a distinct position in regards to our faith and way of life uh, distinct when the Bible says be he holy for I am holy it's not while the word can embrace ethics and morality and, uh, and so forth but that's not what the Lord is talking about when the Bible speaks about holy it means be in such a position that's incomparable God is ineffable and we when people study us there must be no other point of reference but God when, when the Bible says God is holy he, the Bible is basically saying there's no opposite to God the devil is not God's opposite is less than a mosquito in the presence of God he is smaller than bacteria that is invisible to the naked eye in the presence of God and when we talk about holy be ye holy be so distinct that when people look at you they get a picture of the invisible God that's the kind of people our minds have to be clear purified washed in refiner's soap um, um, we need to come to a place where every thought has been crystallized and powerfully formed by the Word of God that everything that we do is governed by Rhema there's no decision that I'm trying to make in these days without making sure it is fixed and founded to a template that I discovered in the Bible as every pattern everything I build has to be based upon the Word of God that definitively directs how I structure my whole life and I'm not saying I'm there totally I struggle one of the greatest praise I prayed this week was God it is so difficult to lead a household like this and to lead people all over the earth because if I lead them wrongly then they will end up in the wrong place the directions I give them must bring them closer to you and nowhere else and sometimes you want to resign from just wanting to lead because of the awesome responsibility of leadership and I want to say to each one of us that's how you have to start thinking because some of you are going to be elevated to a position of such influence and you must know that whatever you do is governed by the wisdom of God so when we talk about this holy position we are talking about being so baptized into God so immersed so pickled marinated into God that there's nothing else you can say but the things that God has influenced you with you know when Jesus in his humanity after he, he had suspended his divinity and did not operate in omniscience but operated in wisdom which was one of the seven spirits that God had endowed him with uh, when he operated in his humanity and he was subject to the laws of gravity and limitations like all of us he learned how to develop or inculcate a lifestyle where he eventually said to his disciples if you heard me you heard my father if you saw me do things and I've patterned it after what he showed me 
In other words, he became a slave to the idea that he could not live for himself anymore, but he only lived for his father. And he even said to his disciples like Philip, have I been so long with you and you still ask, show me the father. If you saw me, you saw the father. And this is the kind of position that the church has to come to. The church must model to the nations what it means to be the holy nation. That's why I say to you over and over again, I know that I live in South Africa, and I know that sometimes I'm f I support teams like Bafana, Bafana, <laughs> and the Pro Tears, and I like my sport, but I'm not a South African. I'm a citizen of heaven living in South Africa. Yes, I know how to give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but I also know what to give, how to give to God what is God's. And each one of us have to come to a place of realizing that wherever God has placed us, we are here to represent his kingdom, to serve him. One of the most beautiful pictures of the church is found for us in Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to read it from the new uh, international version, the NIV version. I want you to get a picture of this because right now there's an attempt by the enemy to flood your minds with that which comes from, from him. And he wants to drown us in, world, in the secular worldview which has been poisoned. Uh, we call this the doctrine of demons. And let me tell you, the doctrine of demons doesn't come to you uh, with the signature of Satan. It comes uh, in various forms of enlightenment. Uh, it comes with intelligence. The enemy is brilliant in the way he presents himself. He, he, he knows how to, to, um, how to present himself in intelligent ways. And this is the picture of the church, the end time church. And, and there's various applications to this portion of scripture, but I want to apply it to the context of our present existence. A great sign appeared in heaven, in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. That's a picture of the church clothed in light, where we don't need the lunar and solar system to tell us about days, weeks, months, seasons, and changing times, where we do not have to live off the spatial context of the universe to tell us how to live. But now we live from the revelation of God. Okay, that's the picture here, clothed, where the sun, the, the, the S-U-N, is no more our light. We are now wrapped in the revelation of Christ, clothed in the most brilliant expressions of the wisdom and counsel of God. With the moon under her feet, meaning there's no more night or evening, and a crown of 12 stars on her head, speaking about apostolic order, structure, organization, wisdom, governance. Uh, it speaks about symbiosis. It speaks, it speaks about a variety of things where your minds are so organized, organized by apostolic order. And the word apostolic speaks about authenticity, uh, genuineness, reliability, absolute order. It's governing our way of thinking. There's nothing in us that is, that is outside of the way God had structured our existence. She was pregnant, this woman, the church was pregnant and cried out as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns on its heads. This is the world system. This is the spirit of the age. Like we had the Amorite, now we're talking about the spirit of the age. This is the world order. Its tail swept 
a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. This is the kind of influence this world system has. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. And this woman is going to produce the sons of God. Uh, the purpose of God will be established through the church. The church gives birth to the, to the sons of God. That's why one of the imageries of God is, uh, of, of the relationship of the church with Christ, is that he is the groom, we are the bride. Now you do know that we're never going to get married to him. That's a metaphor. You can't get married to your brother. Okay, it's a metaphor. In heaven there's no marriage. Not even angels marry. But the metaphor is that if he is the groom, the purpose of marriage in the old covenant was not love first. It was producing seed. And the imagery here is that this woman will, be, will carry the seed of Christ so that sons of God will be produced in the earth. And that's what we want to produce. Not believers, not followers, not adherents of some religion called Christianity. We want to produce the image and likeness of God, and that's called sons of God. And every one of us must be that son. But look at what the dragon does here. He stood so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, and the pattern is Jesus. And we are the corporate son, the pattern son, who will rule, listen to this, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And you can read Psalms chapter 2. You can read the prophecies in Genesis 49 that Jacob gave that will happen in the last days. You can read the writings of Paul or the final statements of Jesus when he said, go into all the world. And it was that we will have global dominion. And this is the kind of church that we have to produce where we would establish rule in the earth. And listen to what is being said here. Who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter and her child was snapped, snatched up to God to, to his throne. That's why in Christ we are seated at the right hand. The woman, the church, fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God. And this is the world that we're living in. It's called a wilderness. One of the images of the world is that it is a wilderness. It's desolate. It can't sustain you. It, it, it is filled with predatorial spirits, with venomous snakes. That's the world that you live in. This is, it is like Daniel in Babylon or the Hebrew boys in a Babylonian system. That's the order that we are living in now. And we must overcome the spirit. And listen to what it says here. Where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days, which is three and a half years, which is 42 months, which is a picture of how Christ ministered for three and a half years, 42 months before you was crucified and the picture prophetically is that the church will complete that by operating and ministering for another three and a half years 42 months I'm speaking now prophetically before then we reach the perfect perfect state or the seven day state and we are moving into this dimension of governance now. and it's it's about to happen and listen to this then war broke out in heaven Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. And this, there's some, you know, I wish we could see what's happening in the realm of the spirit. The kind of warfare that's taking place for the church. How God is keeping us in the midst of a horrible wilderness that we are in. I mean, this world is so desolate. Everything is just, it looks good, but it, it's all false. It's, it's, it's not substantial. It can't sustain us. And the only one that can sustain us is the Lord. Are you with me? Are you with me? Listen to this. Then the war, um, but he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. 
He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And later on in chapter 18 of Revelation, it will be said that the earth is a demonic cage. It's a cage of demons. It's that the whole world order is impregnated with demons. That's why today you can't choose any leader that's part of that order. There's only the only order that can bring us out of this world system is to stay connected to the holy nation, to the government of God, and to the structures of that government. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed, and this prophetically speaks about a future state of existence. Well, this may have happened when Jesus took the throne, but it has to now be fulfilled in a corporate body, and we are the body of Christ. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word. Listen to this. How, you, how do you overcome the Amorite spirit, the present world order? By the blood, by the life of Christ, and by the word of their testimony, by God's word becoming a witness in your lives, a testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, meaning given prophetic advantage, given the ability to fly over every situation. The church has been given amazing immunity and security. We have the wisdom and counsel of God that you can live in this world but not be part of this world. You can be in a lion's den, but lions won't eat you. you Jesus even said it, that, that the authority is given us that even if you pick up a serpent, it won't bite you. And he's not talking about snakes. He's talking about demonic forces um, or poison. And if you drink it, it will not consume you, meaning that the ideologies of this world will not corrupt you because of the God that we serve. Are you with me? The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she will be taken care of for a time, 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 times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. That's why the enemy can't touch us. Say to, the, your, enem to your enemy. <laughs> Say to the person next to you. I hope I'm not being prophetic here. <laughs> Say that you are protected. The enemy can't touch you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. No curse. No witchcraft. You know, you know, I hear people talking about all these crazy things. Let me tell you, if you know how to live in the blood, if you know how to take the word and make it your testimony, no force of darkness can touch you. That's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. Then from his mouth, the serpent, listen to this, spewed water. This is the world order. This is the spirit of the age. This is delusional teachings. This is false teachings. These are half-truths. These are the, the patterns that have been transported into the world today. The new age order. We're living in horrible times. That's why I'm asking parents, you have to teach your kids. You have to develop conversations with them. Our children are being indoctrinated. And I'm shocked at what is happening. When I sit and engage, with people, they tell me things like, you know, our kids are being told at the age of eight, you can choose your gender, you can choose your sex. Now, for me to say that from this pulpit, that will be considered hate speech. That's considered invading 
the privacy and the rights of individuals. That will be called indoctrinating people with things they should not believe. But unfortunately, we have to come to a stage where we have to tell our kids, you're a male and you got no vote. Or you're a female. Are you understanding me? Because let, let me tell you, even you parents won't be able to vote against the decisions of your kids. Courts of law will protect them. And we've got senior teachers like Dr. Rufus here today, and he will tell you of what's happening in certain circles in the world. And we would have to stand up for truth. Are you ready to stand up? How many of you are ready to be martyrs for Christ? Because that's the world order that we're living in now. And that's what the serpent does. He spews water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. And you check the church today. The church has chosen things that the Bible forbids. I mean, it will be called treason what the church is doing today. The church has become part of a new age order. It's been secularized. It just reduces itself to just another religious system that has to keep up with the times. And we, the church of Jesus Christ, can't do that anymore. We have to stand up for truth. And the Bible says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And this church will preach the truth. And some of you will have to take an offering to bail preachers out. Not me, Pastor Chris, and the rest of them. <laughs> but the earth helped the woman. And let me tell you, the earth, not the world, not the cosmos, the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Let me tell you, you're going to see some powerful things happen in the earth, in, in creation. You're going to see how the earth is going to enjoy uh, was going to support the sons of God. All of creation waits in earnest expectation for the manifestation of the sons of God. There's a cosmic groan, and creation will collaborate with the sons to produce the purposes of God. You will see it happen. You will see some supernatural favor come upon you, and even the environment in which you live, uh, the physical environment, will support you. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage warfare against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. That's, I wish we can unpack this. But you go and do your readings on this portion of Scripture. It's a very powerful portion of Scripture. It speaks about this church being clothed with the sun. But a few chapters later, the, that church becomes a harlot riding on a beast that John looks at with amazement and wonder. He is bamboozled by the thought, how did this church that sat in heavenly places arrayed in glory now becomes a prostitute selling herself to the nations of the world? We can't allow that church to become our church. We are not riding a beast anymore. We ride on the clouds of glory. We manifest the will of God. Now let me start introducing, I've got nine minutes to do it, the two kingdoms of the Amorite. The first kingdom is called, uh, a kingdom headed by a king called Sihon. Let's read it in Deuteronomy chapter 2. Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon. Deuteronomy 2.24, rise, take your journey, cross over the river Anon. Look, I've given into your hand Sihon, the king, king of Heshbon and his land. Begin to possess it and engage him in battle. Now to overcome, to overcome the Amorite, there are two particular kings that we have to overcome. The first is called Sion, the king of Heshbon. Powerful secrets locked up in the name. And I will give it to you. And the other king that we must overcome is Og, king of Bashan. And he was also 
an Amorite king, two powerful kings. And I want to just start to introduce us to the king, to King Sion. Sion means warrior. Say to your neighbor, warrior. This is somebody that will worry you. He will torment you. It speaks of a resilient spirit, uh, a spirit that is fearless. It's a fighting spirit, but it's a very, very strategic spirit. It knows how to wrestle with you. It knows how to bring you down, how to find ways of subduing you. The word Sion means warrior, and its capital city was Eshbon. It was located on the western border of the high plains um, of this region, and on the border that eventually the tribe of Reuben and Gad will possess. Very, two very powerful tribes in Israel. The word Heshbon means a stronghold. Everyone say stronghold. So, so when these powers operate, they use, they establish strongholds. There's an eternal principle here. When, when, Jerusalem, when, when Jerusalem was conquered, it had to be conquered by David. The principality that ruled over Jerusalem was a tribe known as the Jebusites. And these were very powerful people, marauding forces. And David understood that you cannot establish a kingdom from Jerusalem unless you first take the Jebusite. David also understood that you cannot take the Jebusite without first establishing a stronghold in Jerusalem. And so he systematically possessed a place occupied by the Jebusites, and he called it the stronghold of David, and sometimes it's called the city of David. And from there, he, he launched a warfare that eventually removed all the forces in Jerusalem, and he established the city of God on a hill, and it was called Jerusalem, God over at an environment that produces peace, shalom, salem, jeru, salem. And that's how God ruled over a space that brought peace to environments. Each of your spaces, you need to remove the, the warrior spirit. In this case, it was Sion. In David's case, it was the Jeb Jebusites. And in taking it, you establish the purposes of God. And how do you know that you've overcome an area? Peace comes upon that environment. Shalom comes upon that environment. And that's how you know that the peace of God that passes all understanding is now invading an area. But this spirit of Sion, the king of Heshbon, Heshbon literally, and I'm going to give you the literal meanings here, um, of, of Heshbon. Heshbon literally means a place that we're planning to place. The word Eshmon means to plan, to establish a rationale for, for how you do things. This is planning. This is forward thinking. This is strategic thinking. This is learning how to do due diligence. It's called, in primitive language, it's called spying out the land. Learning how to assess something, to know its strengths and weaknesses, to know the culture, to know the way those people operate, to know about the, their economy, their military strength, the, 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 the way that they've established their judicial systems, and so forth. So when you talk about a, a, a stronghold that a warrior king used, we're talking about a stronghold where strategy, uh, uh, understanding, uh, a seeking and grasping for knowledge, uh, uh, a place where things were schemed, a scheming of things. It talks about this place, Heshbon talks about a place where you uh, learn how to search out information. Now why am I saying all of these things amongst us here today? You know, 
I found that the world order is very organized. The world order is extremely calculated. It has five-year plans and 10-year plans. It, it plans for the next generation. It, there's always future planning. But I found in the church with all the grace, with all the anointing, all the wisdom, the same people that can work like eunuchs for that world come to church and they are extremely unplanned, disorganized. There's no thinking, there's no strategizing, there's no research. We, we, we don't know how to plan for anything with order. And when I study the Bible, I see people like, like Solomon, so much wisdom, so much of understanding. I mean, when you, I mean, when you study books like Ecclesiastes, with how he tries to analyze, rationalize, try to look at things from a human perspective, even though at the end he feels exasperated, and then comes to the conclusion that if you don't process these things from a heavenly position, everything will, be, will, will, will equate to nothingness, to emptiness, to vanity. And I want to encourage this church today that if you want to take the dominant spirit of this world, uh, which tries to rule your mind, you have to learn now how to, to become judicious in your thinking, how to separate, how to work out things, how to organize, how to implement. And some of this, these things I will talk about in the weeks ahead. Uh, this word, the, the, the feminine uh, form of this word, heshbon, literally means uh, to develop a, mach a machinery, a device. Uh, it speaks about inventions. Uh, discovering and fostering righteous plans. It speaks about how do you develop skillfulness, uh, ingenious, in this context, military devices, uh, devices that people like King Uzziah used when they wanted to fight the enemies. And uh, I think the next phase, if we're going to become a, a, a holy nation that knows how to establish the government of God, uh, then God is going to expect of us that we become a people that, uh, that has innovation, invention, uh, creative ideas, witty thoughts. And, and I'm not talking about it from a human intelligence, please. If there's a disclaimer to all the things I'm going to tell you in the weeks ahead of us, it is that these things can't happen from a human point of view. Um, it can only happen from a heavenly point of view. Some, of, some, some very powerful things are going to be given to some of you. God is going to impregnate you with wisdom from heaven. The wisdom of the ancient of days is coming upon the church. Young people, hear me carefully here today. And I'm not feeding ego. Like Daniel, the grace and glory of God is going to come upon you and you're going to shine ten times brighter than your colleagues and your peers. They may have a higher intellectual quotient than you, but the wisdom of God that will come upon you will make you do things that the world has never seen before. I am convinced of this. When God told me last year that we are now stepping into an epoch, an era, a, a, a period in this present kairos, called aggressive advancement, I was not, I was like a naive fellow thinking, oh, something is just going to happen. But when he started to drop the thoughts into my mind uh, and my spirit that, you, you know, that certain things would happen and it's going to take, you first have to get your mind sorted out and we have to organize ourselves so that, so that we know how the world thinks. And then we need to have the mind of God, the mind of Christ. And then when he showed me the implementation of it, he said, the first thing is that that mind has to grasp knowledge and divine schemes. We have to develop a machinery in this house, in our church circles, uh, that will foster 
skillfulness, uh, and ingenious ways of defeating the enemy. I mean, the genius of David was that he took a stone and put it in his, in his sling, and he brought down a giant that controlled and manipulated and used every psycho psychological trick against the nation of Israel. And with, that was an ingenious moment where the wisdom of God manifested through the defeat of Goliath. And God is saying to me here today that this is the kind of wisdom and counsel that will come to the church. I don't know it all. I'm not an expert in every field. Uh, some of you are phenomenal in your fields of expertise. I mean, I, can't, I don't even have the language to describe the things that you say and do in your fields of influence. But now, is a wisdom that's coming. And I will read to you the scriptures uh, next week about this wisdom that will come. And it's going to catapult you far beyond what Daniel saw from a political point of view. I mean, Daniel made political statements that are now, only now, manifesting in the earth. I mean, it's manifested throughout history, but we're seeing now a culmination of it. We're seeing it now. I mean, Joseph, an economist, developed a feudal system that taught Pharaoh how to become a landlord over nations. He showed him how to plan ahead for the days of famine. He prepared an economy that fed the world by controlling seed. And, and as a result, Pharaoh became a superpower in the then known world. And God is showing us today that a greater than Daniel, a greater than Joseph, a greater than Solomon is in the earth. And we have to start to manifest that. And the spirit, by possessing the king called Sion, you are now possessing a position where strategy, forward planning, future thinking, learning how to become a futurist in the way you see things. And I'm not talking about that just by casting your thoughts and dreaming and imagining things, but developing a mindset of strategic thinking through prophetic sight. I want to talk about prophetic sight next week. My time is up now. Where you would get clarity by seeing into the unseen. Where you would be able to step into realms of the invisible. And, and, and you can go and study people like Elijah, who anticipated things because he was so plugged in. He was so married to the Spirit of God that if a foreign king plotted against the king of Israel, he eavesdropped without the kind of spy technology we have today. And he could tell the king of Israel what was being plotted against him so that they could anticipate the works of the enemy. How's, how, how about that? How about knowing how to beat the stock markets? How about knowing where to put your money and give wisdom because of prophetic sight? Now, these are things that's going to happen. Are you ready for these days? And you know how we're starting it? By separating ourselves unto God by being reconfigured and recalibrated and formatted. I mean, I'm so excited about this. I called a global meeting with all my sons all over the earth for Tuesday this week, just to implement this program so that we can start to move. I'm dragging my feet here with this message because I want you to catch the spirit of it and not just get caught up in the euphoria of the revelation. This is strategy. This is definition. This is how the steps of the righteous are ordered by God. This is how we're going to slip through this very sick world and present the light of his emerging glory. Some powerful things are going to happen. Please stand with me.
Are you ready to be part of a new world order that comes from heaven? Are you ready to be part of the city of God that comes out of God from the heavens into the earth? Are you ready to take ownership of the area that God has placed you in? You know, the Bible tells me that promotion does not come from the east or the west, but promotion comes from the Lord. Are you ready to be elevated like, like Joseph from prison to the palace, from obscurity into a visible place? Are you ready to see how God will take a little, somebody young amongst us and place the wisdom of the ancient of days upon the shoulders of you? so that you could do some powerful things. Let me tell you, some very powerful things are gonna happen. Lift your hands to the Lord. If you believe, that is. If you wanna be part of it, then lift your hands. Shalom on Just, Just rededicate your lives wherever you're standing. You know, you, do you know that your vocation is your full-time ministry? And that if you want to be a true worshiper, you have to be a true server. When Satan asked Jesus to worship him by bowing before him, Jesus said, you will worship the, the Lord of God, your God, and him only you will serve. Jesus, you could not uh, separate vocation from worship. In fact, how you represent God in, your, in the marketplace is what you present as worship when you come to a place like this. God looks at vocation to see whether you're a true worshiper. If you dedicate your life today and your vocation and you say, God, that's, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a serpent's pit. Where I work, it's just demons. It's evil. It's toxic. It's wicked. Then maybe God puts you there to become light. To become an invisible presence. Maybe you try too hard in your own strength. That's why you have anxiety attacks and traumas and sleepless nights. And you don't know how you're going to meet those targets because you're relying on your own strength. Now it's time you come and say, I give you all. I'm presenting everything to you. I'm going to serve you. Some of you think, you know, it's going to be by the sweat of your brow. No, not in the new covenant. In the new covenant, it's going to be through a spirit of rest. You have to labor to enter your Sabbath. You can't enter that Sabbath if you do not know the Lord of the Sabbath, who is a Lord of rest. Come, I want you to present yourselves to the Lord. Come pray for yourselves. If your spouse is with you and, and, and your spouse carries the burdens with you, then join hands and pray together. But we're going to do this because we serve a living God. Shalom on Come, let's pray. Let's pray. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. No more in my own strength. No more in my own might. No more in my own intelligence or in my own experience. But now I'm going to rely on the strength of the Lord, the wisdom of God, the counsel of God, the ability of God. Shara. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise the city of our God the holy place the joy of the
before we leave, before I do so, take those emblems of yours. We are at the table of the Lord. It's a heavenly divine table. And the covenant that Christ fulfilled and established in his blood was a covenant that authorizes us to rule over the earth. It was a covenant that secured our position in Christ so that we would be heirs of Christ. And we don't die to get heaven. We don't have to wait for the resurrection to enjoy the privileges that God has given to us. Those privileges has been given to us now. God told the nation of Israel, I'm giving you the enemy. I will fight for you. But it didn't come to them without them learning how to take it. And it took about 480 years for them to, to overcome all the powers. God said to Abraham, 10, nation, 10 tribes. To Joshua, he said, seven across the Jordan. And to us, God is saying, I'm giving you the nations. And dominion comes in various sectors, in various places. And each one of you standing here must make a dedication today that I will serve you where you put me. No more murmuring. No more complaining. If you're in the wrong position, humble yourself. And stay there until God opens the door for you. Don't complain. Treat it a joy to represent God. If he has to reposition you, he will do it. Because you don't live off the salary you earn. You live off the Lord who promised to, be, to give you himself as an inheritance. He will take care of you. How many of you believe that today? So you're going to make a dedication now? Won't you serve him now? Won't you say to him, I'm going to give you my whole life? And some of you are breaking your fast now also. Do it. Saying to him, my whole life will now be devoted to you. I'm going to learn how to separate unto you totally. And I'm going to learn how to live off you first before I live off some sustenance, some material thing. And we are not here for materialism. We are here to serve the Lord who will make us prosperous, who will bless us. Come, make that your dedication. Father, at this table, we dedicate ourselves to you. This table reminds us of the finished work of Calvary that secured our position as sons of God in your family. And we declare today that we are heirs of the Father and joint heirs with the Son. Everything you created, you gave it to us. And yet so many of us have not seen it become a reality. Many of us are still struggling where we are. But we are declaring today that that struggle is going to be over. Wherever we are, we will have dominion. Daniel ex exercised dominion in a den of lions. The four Hebrew boys exercised dominion in a fiery furnace. Joseph exercised dominion in prison. David exercised dominion over Goliath. We will exercise dominion wherever you placed us. For yours is the kingdom, the dominion, the power, and the glory. We declare that now over every place. Even our homes are no more going to be homes of turmoil and fights and arguments. We declare shalom. We declare Jerusalem. We declare peace. We declare harmony. Even our children that are lost to us will be saved. 
Our homes will demonstrate the glory of God. Our workplaces, our business houses will become places carrying your light. I declare Abedidim upon your people, Lord, that like the ark was in the house of Abedidim, I declare the presence of God on every house here. And let there be great gain, great increase, great fruitfulness. And I thank you, Father, that there will be no room for the devil in our lives. So today we partake of these emblems, uh, not as rituals and acts uh, uh, of religion, but we do it because we are a covenantal people, remembering covenantal promises and enjoying covenantal privileges. We bless you, Father, for what you will do. So we partake now with joy in our hearts, thankful that we could separate ourselves completely to you and live our lives only for you. Go ahead and partake. of the Lord and may his peace be with you. C carry on. Bless you.